protect your DNA. BioPQQ can promote formation of new mitochondria. InfoWarsStore.com Joining us now in studio is our nightly news director, Rob Dude. He's going to talk to us about the death of Justice Scalia. Now, this just happened this past week, and Rob, what were your first thoughts when you heard about the death of Justice Scalia? Well, when I first heard about this, I thought back to early October. In fact, it was uh, October 6, 2015, when Matt Drudge came to our studio. I actually wasn't here at the time, but I was listening intently to that interview, and he had these really, I, I, I guess now you could say in prophetic comments about what uh, conversations he had with a unnamed Supreme Court justice, and, and here's, here's what he said. I had a Supreme Court justice tell me to my face, it's over for me. I said, Matt, it's over for you. They've got the votes now to enforce copyright law. You're out of there. They're going to make it so headlines you can't even use headlines. To have a Supreme Court justice say that to my face, that it's over. They've got the votes, which means time is limited. Yeah, I remember when he said that. Yeah, exactly. Time is limited. They've got the votes. And now what you look at in the Supreme Court, you have a 4-4 Pretty much a tie, a tie, and and Justice Scalia was always the tiebreaker in all these uh, big major decisions, and so people are asking, well, now what's going to happen when uh, you know when a Supreme Court justice dies? What happens? They, they have cases in progress, they have cases that they've written about, but they haven't publicly mentioned. Now here is an AP article by Mark Sherman, and um, let's see, let's go to veteran Supreme Court lawyer Roy Engelbert says that a vote of a deceased justice does not count. So anything he might have said that is not in the official public opinion or that they haven't officially ruled on it yet, anything he might have said or done in that does not count at all. And so I guess what's going to happen, people are going to say, well, you got Obama coming out saying he is going to put out a list of nominations immediately, but that it's a process that they go through to put out a Supreme Court nominee. First, any uh, judiciary, it has to go through the Judiciary Committee where the Republicans hold an 11 to 9 uh, edge in that. Then it has to go through the full Senate where uh, Republicans hold a 54-46 majority. And Mitch McConnell even said, uh, this vacancy should not be filled until we have a new president. And Ted Cruz has also vowed to filibuster any Obama nominee. And then you have Senator Rob Portman of Ohio, who also echoed the same sentiments. Uh, he said it is common practice for the Senate to stop acting on lifetime appointments during the last year of a presidential term. And it's been nearly 80 years since any president was permitted to immediately fill a vacancy that arose in a presidential election year. So this would definitely be something unprecedented we would see if this were to happen. Absolutely. Now, there are many different things that we want to look into as we continue to think about the vacancies that are going to be filled. Uh, actually, Paul made a very good point earlier today when he was talking about the reaction to the death of Justice Scalia. He was pointing out how when people questioned the death of Scalia, I, mean, I have no reason to believe that it was foul play, but some people did question it and they were demonized. They're called conspiracy theorists and this and that. Meanwhile, you can have people who are scrambling to fill the seat of Scalia and those people are viewed as being perfectly OK. You know, the guy's not even in the ground yet. Thus is my understanding. And they're already trying to find uh, who's going to be the next replacement. Exactly. And I don't even think Obama has put out a tweet yet on the death, death of Justice Scalia which is really weird. And also going back to how the Senate, uh, this election year thing where the Senate doesn't want to uh, make lifetime appointments. Back in 1960, they passed Senate Resolution 334, and it is titled Expressing the Sense of the Senate that the President should not make recess appointments to the Supreme Court except to prevent or end a breakdown in the administration of the court's business. So there it is right there back in 1960. And this was passed by Democrats but then back in 2007, you even had Chucky e. Schumer coming out and saying, hey, we got to stop these Bush appointees um, in, a, in a, a year that there's going to be an election. So he was making this statement back in 2007. But now the Democrats are ready to foister in anybody as quickly as possible. Here's what Chucky e. Schumer had to say. We should not confirm any Bush nominee to the Supreme Court except in extraordinary circumstances extraordinary circumstances, he says. <clears throat> and now, who's at the top of the list of nominees? Okay, so Fox News has a pretty good article. Supreme Court shortlist, deep bunch of, of potential nominees to succeed Scalia. Who's at the top of the list, Jakari? Loretta, Loretta Lynch, Lynch, Attorney General. She's at the top of the list. And she had a bitter confirmation hearing in the Senate, and we'll get to that in, in a second of the things she said. Here's some of the other people. Judge Patricia Millett. She's argued 32 cases before the Supreme Court, the second most ever for a female lawyer. 
Also, Judge Sri Srivanasan, he's a principal deputy solicitor general at the Justice Department and has argued more than two dozen cases before the Supreme Court. Also, Judge Paul Watford, who's a conservative libertarian federal judge, and um, he well, he worked for that, that judge, Alex uh, Kaczynski, and he also worked for Ruth Bader Ginsburg as a clerk. So this guy has... Uh, you know, these three also all have deep ties within the Supreme Court. And then we also have the current Attorney General Loretta Lynch. I'm surprised Eric Holder is not on this list. Yeah, they could bring him back and throw him in that spot. I'm pretty sure he'd be quite happy about that. I, I definitely think so. And I think people have to really look at that. But I think they won't. The only reason they won't is to protect a confirmation hearing, which will bring up things like Fast and Furious and all the other things, um, you know, including his brainwashing comments about the Second Amendment. But let's look at Loretta Lynch. Back in uh, 2000, early uh, January 2016, Loretta Lynch warns gun owners, we're watching you. She told a group of reporters that the federal government will be actively searching out those firearms owners who want to st- sidestep registration. And she said uh, specifically she wants to basically take Obama's executive orders and make them a permanent part of you know American society, something that's going to fulfill uh, their purpose long after they're gone. She said she would order require anyone who's engaged in business of dealing firearms to register as a dealer, thus become subject to background checks. And that was what uh, Breitbart reported. And, um, yeah, basically, she is just a hardcore on gun control. And then here is a video from the Daily Mail where she talks about basically thought crime, people who speak out against what they're seeing as this radical Muslim activity that's going on all over the world, especially with these migrants coming into uh, Western countries and then imposing their Sharia law practices on, you know, the people, the Westerners that live there. Here's what she had to say about people and their anti-Muslim rhetoric. Now, obviously, this is a country that is based on free speech, but when it edges towards violence, when we see uh, the potential for someone to lift, lifting that mantle of anti-Muslim rhetoric, uh, when we see that, we will take action. That I think we have, yes, we have charged. 225 defendants with hate crimes offenses over the last six years, most of those in the last three years. Um, Since 9-11, we've had over a thousand investigations into acts of anti-Muslim hatred, including uh, rhetoric. So here we have Loretta Lynch, who's a possible Supreme Court nominee to be a justice, going after the First Amendment and Second Amendment. So that should definitely make people very fearful about what could happen in this election year. Absolutely, and because of how it always happens, they go after the first or the second or the second or the first. Those things are usually very closely related. Now, Rob, you began the talk by discussing how cases will be affected by Scalia's passing. What exactly are the cases that he was looking into? Well, there was one major case which had to do with labor unions, and it looked like the unions were going to have a big defeat. And so it looks like without Scalia, now this kind of is up in the air. There's also a a clash over contraceptives, religious liberty, and they had a big Obamacare health law case that they were looking at. And a lot of these things are behind closed doors. We don't really see them until they come out into the open when they publish their opinions. So it's hard to get the details on these. But there was definitely a lot of things that that were in business. They had a lot of working business going on in the Supreme Court. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens as a result of Justice Scalia's death, and especially... You know, the result of not having any autopsy, not doing any investigation. It's just really looking fishy at this point. Yeah, and we see that, Rob, when they go after the First Amendment, they usually go after the second, or sometimes they go after the second and then go to the first. Well, that's very good insight right there. Now, you know as well as I do, Rob, we have a crew that's on our on the way right now to get out there to South Texas to investigate this death of Mr. Scalia. They're going to talk to as many people as they can, canvas the area, and really try to find out what the locals think about the death. Like I said, at this point, I'm not convinced that any foul pay, play was in uh, in motion here, but we could find out something completely opposite once the guys get on the ground out there. You know, the guy was old, obese, and smoked, but he did die with a pillow over his head, and there's no autopsy. That, to me, just stinks to high heaven. All right, we'll find out what happens as soon as the guys get out there. Thank you, Rob Dew. Mm-hmm. Even win-win, folks. Treating people like we, like we want to be treated. That's why we developed nutraceuticals with Dr. Group and other top researchers, chemists, scientists, you name it. He's one of our advisors to come up with products like Anthroplex that is an original product that, that, that he made just for us. And this is a base 
system to make super male or super female vitality work even better. It is natural. It just helps get your body pumping and going in the way you need to be going. And Dr. Group is here till we go to break to tell us about the latest product at InfoWarsLife.com, Anthroplex, that out of the gates, and we do this all the time with a new product, we discount it out of the gates to get you to try it, knowing that you're going to love it, it'll sell out. So InfoWarsLife.com, Anthroplex, 15% off and free shipping for the next two days only when you get it with super male or female vitality. Let's go to Dr. Group. Why, why do you call this the foundation to start the fire and then the super male takes you to the next level? Well, we, we just look at the base problem that's going on right now in all over the world, which is the endocrine disrupting chemicals, the amount of estrogen that men have, the femininity of men, and what's going on even in children right now with low testosterone levels, low sperm count levels, and the problems that, and the attack that we're seeing on the endocrine systems of both male and female. So I'm always looking for ways to boost that and to make it more effective and naturally get the body to start producing these hormones and balancing themselves. So what we decided to do was how can we add a few other components in there that would actually boost the effectiveness of the super male vitality and at the same time address different issues that the male might have so sure. it would be a full approach. And one of those was zinc. And zinc is actually necessary for the production of testosterone. There's more and more studies coming out that zinc is essential for hormone balancing. What is in the goat weed? You've got one of the purest, strongest organic forms of it. What's so magic about the goat weed? Well, the horny goat weed was given that name because years ago in India, they noticed that the goat, a certain time of the year, this weed would grow and the goats would eat it and they would just go crazy with all the female go goats. So that's, that's how it was developed. It's called epimidium. And what that's been proven to do over thousands of years is increase sexual pleasure, help balance the male hormones. It can actually be used for women as well, but it really kind of resets and brings the hormone balance, improves sperm motility, and increases testosterone. Level. So it counters the stuff they've been throwing at us. Results yeah. will vary overall. All I know is dynamite. I mean, absolutely dynamite with the stamina, with the weightlifting, with the swimming. Folks, the new product is available, Anthroplex, available at InfoWarsLife.com. Dr. Group, thank you for developing this amazing product. Thank you.